Good morning, Crossroads Shemong. For several weeks now, I've been looking forward to being with you this Sunday, but uh, an injury to my shoulder has made it impossible for me to travel to you. So the next best thing, I suppose, is for me to communicate with you via the media. It's a great privilege to be with you, and uh, you may be assured that my wife and I are praying for your church and for your pastor and wife, his wife, as we uh, walk with them in the journey of church planting. That's something that uh, Mimi and I are quite familiar with. Uh, in fact, we had the privilege of being involved in the starting of several churches in uh, South Jersey in the early years of our ministry, almost 50 years ago. But for now, uh, we're going to communicate this way, and as soon as I can make it happen, probably sometime early in the new year, I'll be with you in person. Uh, I'd like to turn your attention to a psalm that has become a very precious one to me, Psalm 34, and I want to read for you uh, just the first 10 verses of this psalm. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be in my mouth. My soul will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and delivered him, saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who hear, fear him, and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack nothing no good thing. Father, help us this morning as we consider your word. Teach us what we need to learn and help us to grow in our knowledge of you and in our walk with you. Now, it's been many years ago since Mimi and I had young children, but my favorite thing to do with them when they were young was to read to them. I always loved to read books to my children. My youngest son is six foot three inches tall. He's uh, an army veteran, uh, has been a, a, a Apache helicopter pilot in three overseas campaigns with the army and he's too big to read to anymore. I do have 10 grandchildren, but even the youngest of them now is in middle school and it's no longer cool for grandpa to read to him. I have four great-grandchildren, but they all live in Australia, and so I don't get much opportunity to read books to children anymore. So I wonder if you'd indulge me and let me read just a few pages of one of my favorite children's stories of all time. It's called Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. And it goes something like this. I went to sleep with gum in my mouth. Now there's gum in my hair. And uh, when I got out of bed this morning, I tripped on the skateboard and by mistake, I dropped my sweater into the sink while the water was running. And I could tell it was going to be a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. At breakfast, Anthony found a Corvette Stingray car kit in his cereal box. And Nick found a junior undercover agent code ring in his cereal. But the only thing in my cereal box was cereal. I think I'll move to Australia. In the carpool, Mrs. Gibson let Becky have a seat by the window. Audrey and Elliot got seats by the window, too. I said I was being scrunched. I said I was being smushed. I said if I don't get a seat by the window, I'm going to be car sick. No one even answered. I could tell it was going to be a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. At school, Mrs. Dickens liked Paul's picture 
of the sailboat better than my picture of the invisible castle. At singing time, she told me I was singing too loud. And at counting time, she told me I left out 16. Who needs 16? I could tell it was going to be a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. I could tell because Paul said I wasn't his best friend anymore. He said that Philip Parker was his best friend and that Albert Mayo was his second best friend. And I was only his third best friend. I hope you sit on attack, I said. I hope the next time you get a double-decker strawberry ice cream cone, the ice cream falls off and lands in Australia. It was a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. That's what it was, because after school, my mom took us all to the dentist, and Dr. Fields found a cavity just in me. Come back next week, he said, and I'll fix it. I said, next week I'll be in Australia. On the way downstairs, the elevator door closed on my foot, and while we were getting ready for Mom to get the car, Anthony made me fall where it was muddy. And then when I started crying because of the mud, Nick said I was a crybaby. And while I was punching Nick for saying I was a crybaby, Mom came back with the car and scolded me for being muddy and fighting. I'm having a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. When we picked up my dad at his office, he said I couldn't play with the coffee machine. But I forgot. He also said to watch out for the books on his desk, and I was as careful as I could be, all except for my elbow. He also said don't fool around with his phone, but I think I called Australia. My dad said please don't pick him up at work anymore. It was a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. There were lima beans for dinner, and I hate limas. There was kissing on TV, and I hate kissing. My bath was too hot. I got soap in my eyes. I had to wear my railroad pajamas, and I hate railroad pajamas. And when I went to bed, Nick took back the pillow he said I could keep, and the Mickey Mouse nightlight burned out, and I bit my tongue, and the cat wants to sleep with Anthony, not me. It has been a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. Mom says some days are like that, even in Australia. Have you ever had a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day, week, month, or year, like 2020? Have you ever been between a rock and a hard place and felt so desperate that you didn't know where to turn or what to do? Well, that's about how David felt in the days and weeks before he wrote Psalm 34. And I believe there's a great deal about you and that you and I can learn from this song of thanksgiving that was written in the most desperate, frightening experience David ever had. The superscription or the introduction to the psalm tells us everything that we need to know. Of David, when he pretended to be insane before Abimelech, who drove him away and he left. The account of this period is recorded for us in 1 Samuel chapters 19 to 21. So let me quickly tell you the story. David was serving in the court of King Saul, the very first king of Israel. Saul started out as a godly king, but he was headstrong. He refused to listen to the advice of Samuel the prophet. And as a result, the Lord rejected Saul as the king, and Samuel secretly anointed David to become the next king of Israel. Now, David served Saul very well, but he'd become a hero in the eyes of the people. He was the champion that had killed Goliath, the giant. The favor of God and man was on him. And even though David was married to the daughter of the king, Saul was jealous of David, and he had decided to kill him. Now, Michal, David's wife, found out about her father's murderous plans. And she helped her husband to escape just hours before the assassination squad showed up at the house. Jonathan, the king's son, was David's best friend. And he confirmed that the king was absolutely furious with David and that he absolutely would kill him if he found him. And he conveyed that knowledge to David. So not knowing where else to go, David fled to the priest Ahimelech. He didn't want to involve the priest in his troubles. 
So David told him that he was on a secret mission for the king. He figured that if the king found out, then when the priest explained that he was trying to help the king, it would be okay for him, for the, for the priest, that is. But uh, it didn't quite work that way. David asked the priest for some food and for any weapon that he might have around. So Ahimelech the priest gave David the food right off the, the table of showbread. It was food that only the priest was supposed to have, but he gave it to David. And he gave him the only weapon that he had in his possession, which happened to be the very same sword that David had taken from the body of Goliath the day he cut his head off and killed him. Well, when King Saul found out, the lie that David had told didn't help the priest at all. In fact, King Saul had the priest murdered. And his entire family was murdered, all except for one son who got away and eventually joined David. And all the other priests who were there at Nob, they lost their lives as well, and their families as well. So David's a fugitive now. He's lost his wife. He's lost his best friend. The king's secret police are hot on his trail. The priest who's helped him has now been murdered. And David is afraid, and he is completely and totally desperate. He asks himself, is there any place at all where I can be safe from Saul? Is there any place he won't or can't look for me? And then he thinks, the only possible place would be in the court of the Philistine king, Abimelech, King Achish. They called all their kings Abimelechs, like Caesar. Now I can, I can almost hear David, half crazy with fear desperate beyond imagining, talking to himself. But Achish rules in Gath, and Gath is the hometown of Goliath. Yeah, but there's no other place that I could possibly go that I could be free, where, where Saul can't get at me. So maybe if I go to Gath, they won't recognize me. <laughs> maybe not. But I bet they'll recognize Goliath's sword. Now, the Bible doesn't actually tell us this. But I'm pretty sure that this was not a decision that David carefully prayed through. This was David acting or reacting, just like most of us do when we're in a situation, a crisis that, that could even involve our very lives. He went into survivor mode, you know, outplay, outlast, outwit. And so he ends up in Gath, hoping that Achish will protect him, hoping that no one will recognize him. But somebody does. Hey, did you see that stranger who just came into town? He looks familiar. I, I think that's David, the Israelite who killed Goliath. A and look, he's got Goliath's sword. Take him to the king. Now David's gone from the frying pan into the fire. But he's got one last trick up his sleeve. In the ancient world, in many different cultures, including this one, uh, they kind of thought it was bad luck to harm people who were crazy. You didn't mess with mad men or mad women because sometimes it was the gods who'd made them mad and uh, they were messengers of the gods. So just to be sure that you didn't offend the gods when you came across people who were mentally disabled or mentally ill, you left them alone. You didn't bother them because you didn't want to anger the gods. And uh, so David, seeing no other way out of his dilemma, decides to act like he's crazy. He starts slobbering down his beard. He starts scratching at the walls, mumbling to himself acting like he's crazy. And I rather suspect that at the very same time, he's also sending up a very desperate foxhole prayer. Oh God, please help me. I've really got myself in trouble this time. You gotta help me. And it works. Achish the Abimelech or the king of the Philistines takes one look at David and uh, he says, don't I have enough madmen in my own country? 
you're going to bring me a foreign one now get rid of him just kick him out he drives David away at which point David runs into the wilderness and he takes refuge in a cave at a place called Adullam now the book of first Samuel tells us that while David was hiding in that cave God began to send to him a ragged band of followers from all over Israel all those it says who were in distress or in debt or discontented gathered around him about 400 men like this is the original Robin Hood story and now that we have the story behind the song we're in a better place to learn what David really wants to teach us here now Psalm 34 is a psalm of thanksgiving but unlike most of the Psalms in the thank you category, of which there are a great many, uh, this isn't just a Psalm that says we should rejoice in the Lord God because of who he is. It, it tells us why the Psalmist is rejoicing in God. And then it goes on to give us some wisdom, some instruction. That's the last part of the Psalm, the part we didn't get to read yet. This is a teaching psalm, and the central idea of Psalm 34, the one thing that David wants to be sure that we do not miss, is this. When you find yourself in a difficult place, the very first thing you should do is praise the Lord. Wait a minute, Pastor. Are you telling me that when I'm caught between a rock and a hard place, between the king of the Israelites and the king of the Philistines, when I've run out of money, when I've run out of resources, when I've run out of time, and when I find myself all alone with no one there to help me, my first reaction should be to praise the Lord? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. And I'm saying it because that's exactly what the Bible consistently tells us to do. Think about 1 Thessalonians 5.18. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will concerning you. Or James 1.2. Consider it pure joy when you have to face trials of many kinds. How about 1 Peter 1.6? 1 Peter, a book written to people who had been caught in the first great persecution wave initiated from Rome when Nero decided that he didn't like Christians and he wanted to kill them, light up the streets of Rome at night with their carcasses. They're spread all over the empire, and Peter writes to them, In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a season, if need be, you're in heaviness through all kinds of trouble. Friends, David didn't begin his flight from King Saul with praise and rejoicing on his lips. He began his flight in abject terror. Panic and fear were the only emotions he was feeling. Those are emotions that you and I are pretty familiar with. But this experience taught David some things, and he wants us to learn what he learned. So here are the three reasons that you and I can rejoice when all the odds are stacked against us. Reason number one. We can rejoice because God hears our prayers. I sought the Lord, David says, and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. At some point in the midst of this terrifying experience, David cried out to God one of those foxhole prayers that we so regularly shoot up when we suddenly realize we're in trouble and there's no way out. Oh, God, help me now. Hear my prayer does. Now, if I were there with you, I could have stopped the service right here and asked you to tell me how many of you have had the experience of knowing that you were in big trouble in way over your head. You shot up one of those foxhole prayers, and you know right now beyond a shadow of a doubt that God heard you and God answered you. Yeah, we could spend the whole day together listening to those stories. It'd be pretty edifying, and I could add two or three of my own. 
I'm not there today but I do want to say this friend if you think right now that God has abandoned you that he might listen to other people's prayers but he's not listening to your prayer I understand why you might feel that way David sure did I certainly have but then David says this poor man cried and the Lord heard him and delivered him from all his fears if you have stopped praying right now because you don't think God's God's listening to you please know this God can hear you God does hear you and when you so deeply are mired in the mud flats of life that you'll never be able to extricate yourself God can deliver you if you call on him he will hear you here's reason number two we can rejoice because we're never really alone David says the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them now David thought he was all alone in the city of Gath and he thought he was all alone again when he was in the cave of Adullam but now he understands that he was never really alone the angel of the Lord was with him. Now, we don't have time to do this this morning. But if I were to take you from the beginning of the Old Testament right through to the end of the Old Testament and examine every single place where that phrase, the angel of the Lord, shows up, I think you would very quickly see with me that in almost every case, maybe in every case, the angel of the Lord turns out to be none other than Jesus Christ himself. In a pre incarnate experience, it was Jesus that Abraham met under the oaks of Mamre. It was Jesus that Solomon met, or, or excuse me, that Joshua met under the walls of Jericho. It was Jesus who was in the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel's friends, when they were thrown into the fiery furnace, and the king looked in and saw four not three men, walking around unharmed, one like unto a son of God. A friend of mine once told me a story. His name was Spence Sutherland, and he was a missionary in Vietnam throughout the entire period of the Vietnamese War. I worked with him later in Australia, where we both were teaching at the Alliance College of Theology. Spence is with the Lord now. But he told me a story I've never forgotten. He said one day during the middle of the war, he and a friend had to travel from where they were up into the highlands of Vietnam, the central highlands, where there was a village of tribesmen that they'd been working with. They wanted to go to the village. They felt like they needed to go to the village, but the U.S. Army was nearby, and so were the South Vietnamese Army. And they told these two missionaries, you can't go up there because the area around that village and the road through that you'll have to travel to get there uh, is completely inundated with Viet Cong irregulars and, and guerrillas and regular North Vietnamese troops. And if you take that road up there, you will undoubtedly get captured and you'll become a prisoner of war or maybe worse. Don't go. Well, they debated a few days, but they really felt God telling them that they had to go. They needed to go. So finally, after praying, they rather uh, tepidly put their feet into the, je the jeep that was going to take them up the road, and they started to travel. It's about a three-hour drive through the jungle. Several times as they were driving up this road, they, they saw movement in the jungle, and a couple of times they actually saw uh, soldiers of the Viet Cong, the North Vietnamese Army. But uh, after three very, very hazardous and worrisome hours they emerged from the jungle they got to the village they did what they needed to do and then they waited a few days and the troops seemed to move off into another area and so they went back down two weeks later spence happened to be on a u.s military base they had taken some prisoners of war from the very area that, that spence had recently traveled through and one of them was wounded and needed help, and as occasionally happened, because Spence could speak Vietnamese fluently, 
uh, they ask him to interview this, this prisoner to see if, if uh, Spence could identify what he needed in terms of uh, help, medical help. So Spence said he, he went into the, the compound and he began to talk with this POW. Uh, after just a few minutes, he realized that this man had been either on or near that road that he had traveled that day on the dangerous trip to the village. And uh, he asked him. And the man said, yes, I was. In fact, I saw you and another man in a jeep going up the road. And our orders were to kill or capture anyone coming up that road. Spence paused for a minute. And he said, well, why didn't you attack us then? And the man said, we would have, but we were afraid of all those warriors in white shining robes. Spence got really quiet for a minute. And then he looked at me and he said, and we thought we were all alone. Friends, if you belong to Jesus Christ, you will never be all alone. His very last words to us before he went back to heaven were these, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the earth. Now here's reason number three. When we're caught between a hard place and a rock, we can rejoice because our God is a deliverer. First, David says he delivers us from all fear. I sought the Lord and he heard me, delivered me from all my fears. The very first enemy that we always encounter when life delivers one of those unexpected blows is fear. Of all of our American presidents of the last 150 years or so, FDR was probably the master of the one-liner. And his most famous one was this, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Now, I'm not entirely sure that's true. That is, I'm not sure that fear is the only thing we have to fear. But it surely is the first thing. Because fear paralyzes us. It distorts our view of reality. And sometimes it makes people do really foolish things. Like running for safety to the king of the Philistines. But when you reject fear, and instead take the time to rejoice in the fact that the Lord God is your God. You put yourself in the place of Psalm 27, another one of David's Psalms that uh, starts with these words. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom then shall I fear? And the answer, of course, is no one. No one. And he delivers us from our foes. Verse 7. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. And he delivers us from all want. Verse 9. Those who fear him lack nothing. There have been, and I suspect there will be more times, when I will not have had everything I wanted. But the promise of God's word is that he will always give me what I need. Paul says it this way, my God will supply all of your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Now, our time is nearly gone here, but I think I must add one more thing to our list of things from which God will deliver us. We've confined ourselves to the first 10 verses of this psalm, but very quickly, if you look at the very last verse of the psalm, verse 22, it says this, the Lord redeems his servants. No one will be condemned who takes refuge in him. He delivers us from condemnation. You know, I think when David looked back over this experience, he had some pretty big regrets, some major regrets. His lack of trust in God at the beginning of his experience led him to run to Ahimelech the priest and lie to the Ahimelech. 
He lied about what was happening, I think, to protect the priest in hopes that the priest's ignorance would shield him from Saul's anger. But when Saul came to investigate, David's lie didn't help the priest. Saul killed him anyway. And his family. And all the other priests. And their families. And David had to live with that. He could never go back and make it right. He couldn't change it. I think we all have some regrets. Mistakes, well, sins, let's call them what they are. Things that we're sorry for, of which we've repented, but which can't really be made right or corrected because the people against whom we've sinned are gone from our lives. We don't get a mulligan. We don't get a redo. But we can receive from God his forgiveness. After yet another big mistake and sin in David's life, a time when he acted out of fear and out of impulse, he wrote these words in Psalm 32 after Nathan the prophet had confronted him with his sin with Bathsheba and Uriah. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. I'm pretty sure that a few of us here today have had some terrible, horrible, no good, very bad days, weeks, months, and years. And that acting out of fear and desperation, we've done a good many things that we horribly regret, from which we need deliverance the deliverance that can only come from knowing that our transgressions have been forgiven and our sins have not only been covered, but completely taken away because that's what Jesus died on the cross to do, to take away our sins. My very favorite verse in all of the Bible has got to be 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So now I hope we understand. When you're caught between a rock and a hard place, the very first thing you should do is praise the Lord. Why? Because God hears your prayers. Because God is with you. And because God will deliver you from your fears and from your foes, from all want, and even from your sin. Father in heaven, help us today to understand, to assimilate, and then to stake our lives on these wonderful truths from your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I look forward to being with you in person the next time.